Good evening. And welcome to the Creepy Little Book. It's a show with a focus on the fringe and mysterious. Everything from the esoteric to the extraterrestrial, the spiritual to the supernatural. And all that lies between. I'm your humble host, Pete. A simple master of mysteries and antiquary of the arcane. Or perhaps... Just a weirdo in the dark. That's really up for you to decide at the end of the night. But we have fun here. Five nights a week, Monday through Friday at 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I'm sorry I'm running a little bit late tonight. Got off the 9 to 5, and here I am. That's how it goes sometimes. Either way, we are here, and we are raring to go. And tonight's a fascinating topic. One that uh, I'm personally revisiting for the first time in a very long time. I had done a short video on this many years ago, but tonight we're talking about Richard Sharp Shaver and the Shaver Mysteries. Amazing stories indeed, no pun intended for those of you in the know. (laughs) Anyway, before we get started here, I want to say thank you to our live stream chat moderator, Tina Tomaszewski. For holding it down in the chat tonight, we do appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tina. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your contribution to the community. Also, I want to point out, everybody, Carl Vibe is here. And if you're not subscribed to Carl Vibe, you should definitely get cracking on that. I believe Tina has dropped a link in the chat here. So get on that, folks. As I said, this is the creepy little book, and I am your host, Pete. Tonight's topic is Richard Sharp Shaver and the Shaver Mysteries, so let's delve right into it. Richard Shaver achieved notoriety in the years following World War II as the author of controversial stories that were printed in science fiction magazines, primarily amazing stories. He claimed he had a personal experience of a sinister ancient civilization that harbored fantastic technology in caverns under the earth. The controversy stemmed from the claim by Shaver and his editor, Ray Palmer, that Shaver's writings, while presented in the guise of fiction, were fundamentally true. Shaver's stories were promoted by Ray Palmer as the Shaver mystery. During the last decades of his life, Shaver devoted himself to rock books, Stones he believed had been created by ancient advanced alien races that were embedded with legible pictures and texts. He produced paintings allegedly based on the rock's images and photographed the rock books extensively as well as writing about them. Posthumously, Shaver has gained a reputation as an artist and his paintings and photos have been exhibited in Los Angeles, New York, and elsewhere. Shaver claimed to have worked in a factory where in 1932, odd things began to occur. As Bruce Lanier Wright notes, Shaver began to notice that one of the welding guns on his job site, by some freak of its coil field attunements, was allowing him to hear the thoughts of the men working around him. More frighteningly, he then received telepathic records of malignant entities in caverns deep within the earth. According to Michael Barkin, Shaver offered inconsistent accounts of how he first learned of the hidden cavern world, but the assembly line story was the most common version. Shaver then quit his job and became a hobo for a while. Uh, Barcoon writes that Shaver was hospitalized briefly for psychiatric problems in 1934, but he does not appear to have had a clear diagnosis. Afterwards, Shaver's whereabouts and actions cannot reliably be traced until the early 1940s. In 1971, Ray Palmer reported that Shaver had spent eight years not in the cavern world, but in a mental institution. So again, your mileage may vary over who you believe in this regard, whether you believe Ray Palmer or whether you believe Richard Shaver. In 1943, Shaver wrote a 10,000 word document entitled a warning to future man. He wrote this letter to amazing stories magazine, and he claimed he discovered an ancient language called Mantong a proto-human language that was the source of all earthly languages. In Mantong, each sound had a hidden meaning, and by applying this formula to any word in any language, one could decode a secret meaning to any word, name, or phrase. Editor Ray Palmer applied the Mantong formula to several words, 
and he realized Shaver was on to something. According to Palmer, his autobiography, The Secret World, Palmer wrote back to Shaver, asking how I learned of Manton. Shaver responded with this 10,000-word document entitled A Warning to Future Man. Shaver wrote of extremely advanced prehistoric races who had built cavern cities inside the Earth before abandoning Earth for another planet due to damaging radiation from the sun. Those ancients also abandoned some of their own offspring here, a minority of humans, noble and human, the Taros. But most degenerated over time into the sadistic Deros, short for detrimental robots. Shaver's robots were not mechanical constructs, but were robot-like due to their savage behavior. These Deros still lived in cave cities, according to Shaver, kidnapping surface-dwelling people by the thousands for meat or torture. While the sophisticated ray machines that the great ancient races left behind, they spied on people and projected tormenting thoughts and voices into our minds. Deros could be blamed for nearly all misfortunes, from minor accidental injuries to illness or airplane crashes and catastrophic natural disasters. Women were signaled out for brutal treatment, and Mike Dash notes the, the S&M was a prominent theme of Shaver's writings. Though generally confined to their caves, Shaver claimed that the Deros traveled with spaceships or rockets and had dealings with equally evil extraterrestrial beings. Shaver claimed to possess first-hand knowledge of the Darrows in their caves, insisting he had been their prisoner for several years. So Palmer edits and rewrites the manuscript, increasing the total word count to a novella length of 31,000 words. Palmer insisted that he did not alter the main elements of Shaver's story, but only added an exciting plot so the story would not read like a dull recitation. Retitled, I Remember Lemuria, it was published in the March 1949 issue of Amazing. The issue sold out and generated quite a response. Between 1945 and 1949, many letters arriving attesting to the truth of Shaver's claims. Tens of thousands of letters, according to Palmer. The correspondents claimed they too had heard strange voices or encountered denizens of the hollow earth. One of the letters to Amazing Stories was from a woman who claimed to have gone into a deep subterranean sub-basement of a Paris, France building via secret elevator. After months of torture, she was freed by a benevolent tarot. Another claim involving the Darrows came from Fred Chrisman, later to gain notoriety for his role in the Maury Island incident and the JFK assassination. Shaver Mystery Club societies were created in several cities. The controversy gained some notice in the mainstream press at the time, including a mention in the 1951 issue of Life magazine. Palmer claimed that Amazing Stories magazine had a great increase in circulation because of the Shaver mystery, and the magazine emphasized the Shaver mystery for several years. Barcoon notes that by any measure, the Shaver was successful in increasing the sales of Amazing Stories. There was a disagreement into the precise increase in circulation, but a reliable source reflects an increase in monthly circulation from about 135,000 copies to 185,000 copies. From 1945 to 1948, Barcoon notes that seventy-five 75% of the issues of Amazing Stories featured Shaver mystery content, sometimes to the near exclusion of any other topic. Historian Mike Dash declares the Shaver tales were amongst the wildest ever spun, even in the pages of pulp science fiction magazines of the period. They also published in Other Worlds magazine. The first issue featured his story, The Fall of Lemuria. Many science fiction fans felt compelled to condemn the Shaver mystery as the Shaver hoax. These fans, allegedly distressed by Palmer's swift away from literary or hard science fiction of earlier years to slapdash space operas, organized letter-writing campaigns to try to persuade the publishers of Amazing Stories to cease all Shaver mystery articles. In fact, Palmer printed a number of critical or skeptical letters sent to Amazing Stories, and he and other contributors occasionally rebutted or replied to such letters in print. As Bruce Lanyard Wright notes, the young Harlan Ellison, a later famously abrasive writer, allegedly barraged Palmer to admit the Shaver Mysteries was a publicity grabber. When the story came out, Palmer angrily responded, this was hardly the same thing as calling it a hoax. Dash writes that the critics of the Shaver Mystery were quick to point out its author was suffering from several classic symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia, and that many of the letters pouring into Amazing recounted personal experiences that backed up the author's stories patently came from the sort of people who would otherwise spend their time claiming they were being persecuted by invisible voices or their neighbor's dog. During 1948, Amazing Stories ceased all publications of Shaver stories. 
Palmer would later claim that a magazine itself was pressured by sinister outside forces to make the change. Science fiction fans would credit their boycott and letter writing campaigns for the change. The magazine owners said later that the Shaver Mysteries had simply run its course and sales were decreasing. The Shaver Mystery Clubs had surprising longevity. Representatives of a club discussed the Shaver Mystery on John Nebel's popular radio show several times throughout the late 50s. Nebel said he had thought the discussion was entertaining, but in extant recordings, he was also skeptical about the entire subject. And Long John Nebel interviewed Richard Shaver himself in 1949. I think you might be able to find that here on YouTube. But that absolutely happened. Long John Nebel was like the first guy to do late night paranormal radio and address these kind of weird topics. So, you know, before even Art Bell, there was Long John Nebel. So after the Paul Magazine loses popularity, Palmer continued to promote the Shaver Mysteries to a diminishing audience veering the via the periodical The Hidden World. Lanyard described the magazine as Shaver in the Raw with a little of Palmer's editing. Shaver and his wife produced a Shaver Mystery magazine irregularly for some years. So it was very popular. It was very popular. Then the rock books in the 60s and 70s. Uh, during the 60s and 70s, Shaver's living in obscurity, searching for physical evidence of bygone prehistoric races. He claimed that in certain rocks, he believed were rock books that had been created by great ancients and embedded with legible pictures and texts. For years, he wrote about the rock books, photographed them, and made paintings of the images he found in them to demonstrate their historic importance. He even ran a rock book lending library through the mail, sending a slice of polished agate with detailed descriptions of what the writing, drawing, and photographs he claimed were archived by Atlanteans inside the stones using special laser-like devices. Shaver never succeeded in generating much attention for his later findings during his lifetime, but there have been exhibitions of Shaver's art and photographs in the years since his death. Artist Brian Tucker created an exhibition about Shaver's life and work in 1989 at the California Institute of Arts and presented Shaver's work again years later at the Santa Monica Museum of Art and the Guggenheim Gallery of Chapman University in Orange County, California. In 2009, Tucker curated Mantong and Protong. Ah, Mantong and Protong. You know, well, Protong is a different story here. So Mantong comes from Shaver and Protong comes from Sukowski. Um, but this says this was an exhibition at Pasadena College, which paired Shaver's work with that of Stanislaw Sukowski. Shaver's art has also been exhibited in galleries in New York and a traveling exhibition of outsider photography called Create and Be Recognized that originated in the Yerba Buena Center for Arts in San Francisco in 2004. In that exhibition, which toured the U.S., Shaver's rock book photography was grouped with famous outsider artists, including Henry Darger and Adolf Wolfie. So, uh, much like Shaver, Shaver had Mantong, which he believed was the primordial language of the world. That it was, you know, the ancient language, which was the root of all languages that existed. Similarly, <clears throat> Stanislaw Sukowski had Protong, and he wrote a book called Behold the Protong, uh, regarding the belief that he had found the original lost language of the world that was called Protong. Now, I don't know how much one influenced the other, <clears throat> but I do find it fascinating that there is a similarity there. And I think that's even more fascinating. There was an exhibition at Pasadena College which paired their work together. Um, after its initial effect on the Amazing Story readership, the Shaver Mysteries continued to influence science fiction and other general literature. Many modern books, films, and games make references to Darrow's and other aspects of Shaver's story. The Shaver mystery has also influenced believers of paranormal phenomena. It's taken various forms from suspected connections between Darrow's and UFOs to appearances of Darrow's in the mythology of the Church of the Subgenius. As noted above, Harlan Allison reportedly thought the Shaver mysteries was nonsense. However, he did use elements of the Shaver mystery in one of his own science fiction stored stories from A to Z in the chocolate alphabet, featuring 26 brief stories, some a few pages long, others comprising only a few sentences. One story, The Elevator or People, reports that there are 500 buildings in the United States whose elevators go deeper in the basement. Those unfortunates who descend into the caves emerge nearly catatonic after being treated by the evil cavern inhabitants. <clears throat> in 2004, the Japanese horror movie Marabito, directed by Tashiki Shimizu, also references Shaver's work and the Darrow's. The movie references Shaver's book directly, as well as showing Darrow's several times during the film. Well, that's pretty interesting. I'd be curious to see that. 
Richard Shaver and the Darrows are mentioned on a plaque in the video game Shivers next to a sculpture of a Darrow in the subterranean world room. Both Shaver and his work, as well as Amazing Stories, are amongst the esoteric and unusual ideas referred to by Philip K. Dick's novel Confessions of a Crap Artist. In the role-playing game, which is heavily influenced uh, by pulp and weird fiction in its development, Dungeons and Dragons, there exists a race of evil subterranean dwarves called the Darrow, which were first described in the AD&D first edition of Monster Manual 2. These Darrow make raids on the surface to kidnap humans to use as slaves and food, and some among them, called servants, possess magical and psychic powers which they can use to influence people's minds. They are said to have a main stronghold deep underground where they plot the overthrow of humanity. In the novel Tamper by Bill Ettrick, takes his name from Shaver's descriptions of the Darrow's ability to tamper with the minds of humans with invisible rays. In the book, a boy obsessed with the Shaver mystery begins to hear strange noises in parents' basement, which may or may not be real. In the summer of 1947, Kenneth Arnold claimed to have seen UFOs near Mount Rainier. His report created widespread interest in unidentified flying objects, and Palmer was quick to argue that the flying saucers were variations, uh, were a validation, rather, of the Shaver mysteries. For several years, he noted Shaver had mentioned the Darrow's supposed spaceships. The idea that Shaver and Palmer somehow predicted or presaged the flying saucer craze was later championed by writer John Keel. In his 1983 article, The Man Who Invented Flying Saucers, first published in 40 and Times, declared that Palmer assigned artists to make sketches of objects described by readers and disc-shaped flying machines appeared on the covers of his magazine long before June of 1947. So we can note that a considerable number of people, millions, were exposed to the flying saucer concept before the national news media were even aware of it. Anyone who glanced at the magazines on a newsstand or caught a glimpse of the saucer emblazoned Amazing Stories cover had the image implanted in his subconscious. However, UFO researcher Jerome Clark would argue just the contrary. While it might be stressed that Palmer did not depict the terror's rockets as disc-shaped, nonetheless, in later years, some would insist with more hyperbole than reason that through Shaver's yarn, Palmer invented flying saucers. In fact, Palmer's influence beyond his relatively minuscule audience of science fiction fans and Fordians was non-existent. The poet and folklorist Jesse Glass joined Shaver's Atlantean Library early in the 1970s as a young man and briefly corresponded with him. He was intrigued by Shaver's rock books and their accompanying descriptions, but noted that sometimes the surface of the stone seemed to be treated in some manner. One piece of stone looked like the surface was actually a drawing or a rubbing on paper that had been heavily shellacked or somehow glued on. In fact, bits of white paper seemed to be showing through the shellac. Glass corresponded with Shaver and found him to be intelligent and well-read until one day out of the blue, the letters took on an abusive tone. It was then that Glass ended the correspondence. The artist Jermaine Rogers had often used his vision of the Darrows, and many posters used to advertise rock music concerts. Rogers has approached the subject of Darrows with ambiguity that some have taken as proof he truly believes in these beings. Starting in 1994, Rogers Darrow has appeared in dozens of his posters and art prints, and in 2004 became a designer vinyl toy line. And the bibliography for Shaver is ridiculous. Uh, amazing stories. Uh... Fantastic Adventures, Other Worlds, Fantastic Magazine. You know, they were just pumping these out in the magazines <clears throat> between 1945 and 1948. Uh, and even then, a few more trickled out after the fact. Now, Shaver made a lot of wild claims. So let's take this back to the beginning. Shaver was working in a welding plant when he believed that his machine was allowing him to hear the thoughts of his co-workers. This was the case. So he quits his job. He quits his job and he becomes a hobo. He did find himself once locked up in the county and he was rescued by a tarot who he thought was a ghost. But uh, she turned out to be a tarot from the inner earth. And she rescues him from jail and takes him underground. He marries this tarot woman. And uh, he writes extensively about their love together uh, under the augmenter, ancient augmenter beams 
of the uh, Atlans and the Titans. And that's who he believes started this whole thing rolling. There were the Atlans and the Titans. And... Oh, Jeepers Creepers. I just realized something. Shucks. Give me a second. I just realized something. I'm going to need this bell from later, and I got it sitting all the way up on the bookshelf. Okay, I'm back. I'm back. You can see me now. Uh, yeah, Richard Schaefer is an interesting story. I did a, a whole uh, short video on this years back regarding... Oh, there goes my light. Just a moment. Just a moment, please. We're having some uh, technical difficulties. Okay. All right, we're back. Hopefully that light holds. Hopefully the light holds. Hopefully it sticks out. We got 20 minutes out of it before it fell, so I appreciate that. That's that's pleasant. So uh, if we can keep that track record going, then we'll be doing okay. Anyway, the Shaver Mysteries. These 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 people uh, were believed to have come here in the ancient past. They were the Atlans and the Titans. So the Atlans and the Titans come to Earth in the ancient past, and they institute fantastic technology around the world. Uh, but they lived underground. They live underground because of the harsh radiation of the sun, which eventually is why they left to find a new world. So with this in mind, they abandoned some of their offspring here. And those offspring, the abandoned arrow, that's what they were called, the abandoned arrow. And the abandoned arrow become two factions. They become the humanoid and the good taros. And then you have the degenerated, bloated, monstrous Deros. And, uh, and it said that there are elevators around the world with a secret button that takes you down past the basements into the caverns of the Deros. And they need to come up here, too, to get food. And they also snatch people. So, I mean, maybe some of you have seen this map of the uh, cave systems around the United States and also people that have gone missing. You know, so there could be some kind of connection there. Could be the case. I don't know. Anywho, as we kind of move along through this, you got to understand that the Shaver really produced a voluminous tome of work here. Many stories were spun out of this whole yarn and they have to do with Lemuria and this ancient lost continent and these people that have populated. Um, they're very strange stories. Um, let me see here. Carl vibe. Have you heard the Philadelphia experiment started with an overpowered welding machine? I, no, that's a first for me. I was not aware of that. I figured they were just using Tesla tech when they were uh, cranking off the old uh, Philadelphia experiment. I figured a lot of Tesla tech had something to do with it. And, uh, you know, they ripped a hole in space time that they weren't prepared to uh, close. And that's where the Montauk project comes in. They had to go back in time to shut it down while it was in hyperspace. So that's, you got to figure that's crazy. Well, at the same time they were jumping off the boat, they were coming back in time to shut down the machine because it kept the boat trapped in hyperspace. That's wild stuff. Spring Hill Max, someone said several years ago, he went down a secret floor by accident at the Denver International Airport and saw giants, giants beneath the earth. Well, that, that wouldn't shock me over the Denver International. Or rather, it looked like it was made for giants down there. Well, I mean, there's an extensive tunnel system down there. You know, you got to figure. I don't even think that's a secret. There's, there's, you know, tunnel systems out there.
I don't know about being on the ground. I'm kind of claustrophobic. I don't know if I'd be cool with that. Don't know if I would be cool with that one bit personally, but that's just my assessment of that, <laughs> that situation. Zachary Gilkerson, whenever Missing 411 would come back into my mind's eye, the time I heard you tell me about the Darrow always came to mind. Yeah, I mean, there could have something to do with it as well. I mean, we, you know, that's that's the story that these ancient creatures from under the earth are snatching people up and taking them down there. Taking them down into the Darrow and Tarot Caves. I have even seen maps of the Hollow Earth that feature Darrow and Tarot Caves. I think the map of the Hollow Earth that I uh, have on my Teespring store features the Darrow and Tarot Caves. It's a classic Hollow Earth map. I'm sure you guys have probably seen it. But you can get it on all kinds of merch in my store uh, if you're interested. Masks and leggings and T-shirts and the whole nine. But uh, it does feature the Darrow Caves. But, you know, the Darrow were claimed to be responsible for everything from minor accidents to plane crashes. And, of course, the Darrow have advanced technology. they got rocket ships. they got spaceships. So who knows if the occupants of the UFO might just be the Darrow. What if underneath that gray alien exterior is really the Darrow's? The disgusting Darrow's who snatch people up from the streets and take them down to their Darrow caves for food. Go vibe! I just saw a video where a guy claimed there was a portal elevators and hallways from Maine to Florida for certain officials to use to travel the solar system like Monster Sync. So real-life Stargates. And one would wonder if uh, these kind of uh, Darrow technology would also have something to do with Stargates as well. You know, are they able? To, are they trapped on this world? Maybe they were trapped on here. Maybe that's why they were called the Abandoned Arrow, because they were left behind and trapped here. Uh, just for take us, there's a guy on YouTube that tells a crazy tale about the Darrow. I believe his name it was Brenton Sawin. Uh, he has since passed away, but he did some great work on the Darrows and Tarrows a few years back uh, while he was still with us. Brendan Sawin. Yeah, he did a lot of uh, Dogman and Bigfoot stuff, too. Uh, yeah, he used to do interviews. He had a pretty good channel. said they used a beam to immobilize him and he was freed from them. Yeah, something to that effect. They do use beams. They've got, you know, these uh, beneficial rays that they shoot from these beams and that's how they keep you alive down there. Yeah, Jess Ortega by a lion's roar. That's exactly who you're talking about. That's Brenton Sawin. I've seen the same video. Yeah, he was freed from them by a lion's roar. Something scared them off. Carl says it's odd that we regularly talk about UFO mind control under ocean UAPs and bases and robotic ET and AI crafts like it's all possible. I don't think it's odd at all, man. I'm I'm into the woo woo stuff. Like, so the crazier it is, I'm all about it. You know, uh, uh, much respect to people who uh, are into the nuts and bolts of this stuff from the day to day. Uh, they're really out there on the forefront of making disclosure happen. If anything, I drag it down because I'm like, yes, Bigfoot's an alien. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, why wouldn't you think that? You know, uh, but but that's the that's the fact of the matter is I love the woo woo stuff. I love the far out. I love the unexplained. Uh, you know, the crazier and weirder it is, the better, better. And the shaver mysteries are pretty crazy and weird. You know, and, and what it comes down to is I recommend you read them. Um, you can find them. I'm sure you can find them for free on like. Uh, uh, they might be on sacredtext.com or Bibliotheca Pleiades or somewhere like that. Uh, I think they're all over Amazon, too. I remember Lemuria, Shaver Mysteries, book one.
one of the most controversial pieces of science fiction ever written. I wonder why nobody's ever tried to revive the Shaver mysteries in science fiction and, and bring it back to a new audience. I'm curious. I'm curious. Zachary Gilkerson says, I forget Fire in the Sky guy's name. It's uh, Travis Walton. But that's terrifying. If he wasn't kidnapped out of space this whole time, it was taken into the Earth. Well, I mean, they put him back together and set him free. So the, that's not something that the, the Darrows would do. Jethro Falk, how you doing, Jethro? Is Shaver in the public domain? I don't know. I don't know because no, I mean nobody's publishing amazing stories anymore. Uh, I don't know who's who. Let's say Shaver Mysteries Book One. Who's the publisher? So somebody's publishing the Shaver Mysteries right now. You can get them in paperback for like 12 bucks. Armchair Fiction looks like the publisher. Armchair Fiction, Medford, Oregon. The original text of this novel was first published by Ziff Davis Publishing Company. So I don't know if Armchair Fiction has the rights to Richard Shaver or if Richard Shaver is in the public domain and you can just kind of uh, do whatever you want with it. That's something I'd require a little more research to figure out. So, I mean, if they are to be believed, then there's fantastic technology waiting to be discovered inside the Earth. Sapphire Elf, is there a physical description of what the Darrows look like, please? Sorry if I missed it. Uh, from my understanding... And I don't know if this is based on the artwork of the Darrows that was done to accompany the magazines or if it's depicted directly in the text. I can't recall. Or at least from I remember Lemuria. Uh, they are bulbous, prone to illness. They have uh, lots of genetic diseases uh, because they are just degenerated creatures. Uh, they are supposed to have really long, weird noses. And uh, that's a distinguishing feature of the Darrow. If you do a quick uh, Darrow search, uh, like search Darrow, D-E-R-O, in, uh, you know, with Darrow Shaver Mysteries or Darrow Tarot, You'll probably get some uh, artistic representations of them. And that's generally what they look like is just these weird, big-nosed creatures. Uh, humanoid in appearance. Uh, I guess they could pass when they get to the surface world in some regard as people. Because they have to... I mean, Richard Shaver himself said they had to come up and get food. Zachary Kilkerson for $10. Thank you, Zachary. Much appreciated. Zachary says, number one fan. Well, thank you, Zachary. I really appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. Oh, man, I totally missed halftime here. Listen, folks, you got to let me know if I'm not doing halftime. I, I got to, I got, I'm, I'm talking and I'm not watching the clock. So let me go ahead and take care of this real quick, folks, if you don't mind. If you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and take care of this real quick. 
Hey there, hi there, how you doing? Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate your time, your energy, and your contributions to these conversations. I also want to thank our moderator, Tim Tomaszewski, for being here. And I thank each and every one of you for being here tonight as well. Now listen, if you're new here, I ask that you subscribe and click that notification bell so you never miss an upload. We're a live stream. We do this every night, Monday through Friday. Uh, so uh, you can catch us at 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, hanging out here, talking about something weird, getting down to some mysterious tales or some ancient bygone magics or whatever strange things come up in our conversations. But uh, I hope that's what you like, and I hope that's what you're here for, and you'll subscribe. Likewise, I'd like to recommend you check out the description of this video where you'll find links to my Twitter and Instagram, my social media. Uh, likewise, you'll find my email and my P.O. Box if you'd like to send me books. I do so appreciate books, and uh, I do collect them. So if you got books to get rid of and you want to send them my way, then go ahead mail me a book. Lastly, if you'd like to support this stream financially and you're in a position to do so, there's three ways you can. First is through PayPal directly. Second is the Spring Store with fun merchandise inspired by the esoteric and the extraterrestrial, the spirits and the supernatural, and all that lies between you. Hermes Trismegistus t-shirts, Resist Reptilians hoodies, Hollow Earth leggings, and mugs of all varieties, all kinds of fun stuff. Then there's Patreon, where for just a dollar a month, a quarter a week, less than the price of a cup of coffee, you can help support the stream, and I thank everybody who does for believing in what we do here and backing it with your buck. Lastly, if you ever missed the stream, you can catch the replay like uh, on Spotify and Spreaker and iHeartRadio. So uh, check them out there, and don't forget to download. Thanks so much, everybody. Oh, nice clean ding. That's what we get there. I, I like the new dinger. It's metal in composition. So when it strikes the bell, it's always a resounding ding. I really do like that. Thanks again to Carol's Cookies for the bell. And the new striker. I can't even call this one a dinger because it's a striker. DJ T shows here. How you doing, DJ D? Good to see you, man. Hit that like button, says DJ D. Well, thank you so much, my man. Thank you for being here. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, sorry, I was running a little late with the uh, the lot the uh, halftime here. I'm just I'm just running behind all day here, everybody. It's just been that kind of day. You know, one of these days, one of these days, I'm gonna get it together. One of these days, I'll get it right. But today was not the day. <laughs> Mark Duffy Music says, The Red Dwarf who writes with his tail. It looks like a really interesting story. Amazing cover on that one. Are you familiar with what that one is about? No, not off the top of my head there, Mark. Um, there are a bunch of them. Like, I mean, you can pick them up. They're, you know, they're, they're reprintings of the pulps. And for 12 bucks a pop, I think I'm about to start collecting them because I wouldn't mind having me a little library of Richard Shaver mysteries here uh, in the old uh, office. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Nameless, I've missed many creepy little books. Well, you're here now, Nameless. Is that a crass logo that I see there? All right, man. Banned from the Roxy. Okay. Never much like playing there anyway. Good to see you, Nameless. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Glad you could be here with us. <clears throat> Striker, I think there's a Leslie Nielsen joke in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, Jabber Falls. Definitely, definitely. Arlene Atkinsell points out that if Pete is on time and nothing goes wrong, I will assume the aliens replaced him. Well, that would be a good assumption. If my light wasn't falling or if I wasn't forgetting something or things weren't uh, not working right when they were supposed to, then it would definitely not be me. But, uh, hey, what can you do? Oh, we're shredding. Man, I got distracted and missed the halftime activities. Damn. Well, you know, it's just the same thing every night. You're not missing anything special. It's just a two-minute spiel. Just a two-minute elevator pitch where I try to get you to check out my social media links and, uh, you know, send me books or cash. <laughs> Never forget, everybody. I started the creepy little book because I was trying to make a few extra bucks. That's really what it came down to. I said, I know a lot about this kind of stuff. Maybe I can make a few dollars talking about it on the internet. That was the dream. That was the dream. And now the dream is reality. And I thank all of you for that. You give me the platform to do this. I appreciate it because it's awesome. It really is. 
I know I'm not good with being on time, but that happens because I, you know, I work before I do this, and then you know my work day ends, and I do this right after. I'm like immediately after. Like there's literally like a half an hour between my work day ending and here. <laughs> so uh so that's how it works. Um, but yeah. Uh anyway. Cows Cookie says, keep digging on that dream. Well, I will. You know, the dream is coast to coast AM one day. That's the dream. That is the dream. But we'll see. We'll get there. One of these days, we'll get there. Even if it's just as a caller. Maybe I'll just call into George Norrie and just say hello. Hey, George, just wanted to call in and say hello. Tell me that time about you burn yourself with the pizza rolls or fell in that mud puddle. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. It's comical stuff. I'm telling you, it's comical. But you know what's not comical? The story of Richard Shaver. Because the fact of the matter is, either Richard Shaver was telling the truth, and he was trapped in the Darrow Caves for eight years, fighting for his life, l reliving different lifetimes under the augmenter beams. Or he was a paranoid schizophrenic who was coming up with crazy stories. So that could be the case. Anywho. Ah, Nameless says that is crass. There we go. I knew it. I knew it. Good stuff. Yeah, I always like Crass. I mean, I was really into the exploited and like all that street punk, like uh, you know, like I like ninety street punk and I like the old eighty four Mohican stuff. Uh, but I always like Crass. I always have a spot for them. I think they're a pretty good band. You know. And the subhumans, I think, were right up there with them, uh, in that regard. Subhumans are pretty good too. Mark Adelphia Music suggests maybe take a Sharpie and write art on your bell as a tribute. Then every time you ring it, you're one ding closer to your dream. I like that suggestion, Mark. I do like that suggestion. That is true. We'll, we'll just call the bell art from now on. Man, Rave Hope, I'm more of a ska man myself. Nothing wrong with ska music. I do like ska music myself. There's a Ska Tunes Network is a channel I follow here on YouTube. Uh, it's a one-man band, uh, and this kid is just incredible. Uh, he plays everything. It's keyboards, uh, brass section, guitar, bass, does all the drumming, does everything. Uh, and he does a lot of cover songs. I think he does an original here or there, but it's the Ska Tunes Network. And uh, he's really good. Cow's Cookies gives me permission to make that change to the bell. Oh, okay. I'll have to find a Sharpie around here somewhere then. I don't know if I have one. I'll have to, maybe I'll order a Sharpie. How do you not have a Sharpie? Yeah, there's Tina with the link to the Scott Teams Network. Thank you, Tina Tomaszewski. Much appreciated. <clears throat> yeah, so if you're not familiar, uh, they're pretty good. Bad Brains, some Bad Brains fans in the chat. I like it. There's a lot of that good stuff. Black Flag, Circle Jerks. And I don't like a lot of the California stuff. You know, Youth Brigade, they weren't bad. But, uh, but yeah, I've, uh, I never really was huge into the California stuff. I like some of it. But uh, for the most part, it was really the UK 84 stuff. Like, that's that's really what got me going. And and like I said, the street punk of the East Coast of the 90s. There's a good band out there now called Stolen Wheelchairs. He's got a YouTube channel. He just uploaded a video a couple of days ago. Um, they're doing a cover of Off With Their Heads, I believe. Anyway. <clears throat> Is 
Zachary asks if I have checked out any of the psychic work being done over the Farsight Institute and their channel. Fascinating. No, you know what? I'm not familiar. I think you might have mentioned the Farsight Institute before, but I have not seen that. So let me jot that down. Farsight Institute. All right, I'll check that out. Yeah, nameless, there are multiple reports of derelict cryptids described as little evil, ugly monsters with mini trunks for noses. They do they do have like an elephant trunk almost. They do have like an elephant's trunk. That's how they're depicted. Uh, John says, Angry Samoans, anyone? Yeah, the Angry Samoans are pretty good. But again, I, I mean, like, I, I didn't really get into so much of the American punk because I did the UK stuff. But uh, Angry Samoans aren't bad. I always lumped them in with like uh, TSOL or Token Entry. Well, I guess Token Entry would be more of a hardcore band. Uh, Shaver being schizophrenic is what I find so interesting about his stories. Everything involved mind control and paranoia, says JM. And JM's right. There was a lot of paranoia in his stories uh, and lots of mind control beams. They had mind control rays. They had beneficial rays. They had augmenter rays. You know, they had these different technologies that provided different effects. <laughs> Elroy Shredding. Says getting lit up tonight by Buck Cherry. Time to anti Diluvian peeps. That's two. If you're playing the home game, everybody, that's two sips of your soda pop. So go ahead and have some. Tina dropped a link to stolen wheelchairs, the off with her head cover right there. Let's check that out. That's from the Punksylvania gathering, I believe. Uh, something that I uh, wish I was still young enough to attend. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now they'd be like, get out of here, dark. <laughs> Uh, well, what can you do? You get older and things go away. <clears throat> Less than Jake. Oh, TSOL says Macarena. That's right. TSOL. Man, Ray of Hope says Less than Jake. I saw Less than Jake live. I saw Less than Jake open for the Mr. T experience. It was a good time. It was a long time ago. Oh, Carol's Cookies is asking a pertinent question here. Did you grow your Bigfoot yet? You need to show us what it looks like. Uh, yes, I did uh, put the Bigfoot into water. He is almost completely emerged from the tree stump. So maybe I'll post a picture of that to Instagram. That's probably a good place to put that. Mark Duffy Music says, I love the idea of you getting that collection for the shelf. Pete. Yeah, I think it would be a good, uh, good collection to have the Shaver Mysteries. Hologram and Unchuck, Johnny Quest was a sellout. It was a good song. Yeah, Johnny Quest was a sellout, Ninth and Pine. That whole album uh, was a great album. I, I thought like a Hell Rock View is another good album by the uh, by them, by Less Than Jake. Hell Rock View, All My Friends Are Metalheads, uh, Boring Life in Boring Town. Nameless, uh, back on track here. Wasn't the guy using welding tech when the initial interaction with the Darrows happened? You're absolutely right. He was a welder in a factory. And he believed his welding machine was picking up the thoughts of the men around him and was allowing them to hear people's thoughts. So he walked off the job and became a hobo. And that's kind of how his story starts. Cow Cookie says we need to see, and that's awesome that you used it. Well, of course, I was I showed it to the kids. I was like, here, I'm gonna grow a Bigfoot for you, kids. Come gather around. Watch me put this stump in water, and then nothing happens for 12 hours. <laughs> so it's a little anticlimactic. It's like, hey, you want to come look at the Bigfoot today? See if it's any bigger? My son said he didn't want to touch it because he didn't want to turn into a Bigfoot. So, uh, so yeah, there's that. He didn't want to turn into a Bigfoot. He didn't want to touch it. 
I said, you don't have to. <laughs> it's okay. It's a weird Bigfoot that grows in water. It's probably pretty squishy. But I appreciate that. Cow's Cookies. So those of you who know what I'm talking about, Cow's Cookies had sent a, a care package over in the P.O. box uh, with a uh, uh, little plastic tree stump that you submerge in water and then a Bigfoot grows out of it. So there you go. That's what it was. JM says you need to make him watch Harry and the Hendersons. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think when, uh, you know, when they're a little older, definitely. I, uh, I've been trying to use the, a lot of these eighties movies that I'd like to show to my kids. I'm trying to use the age. I saw them as a gauge for when they're old enough to see it. Um, so I try to think about how old I was when I saw Ghostbusters and it was when Ghostbusters was new. So I want to wait till they're around that same age. Uh, you know, and then, you know, when they're older, then they can watch uh, some of these other movies. Like I'd like to show them Batman 89, but I mean, it's a PG 13 movie. You just got to wait on that one. You know what I mean? But I, I intend to show them all the classics when they're age appropriate, I guess, or at least when they're as age appropriate as I was when I saw them, you know, anyway. Yeah. I played labyrinth for them the other day. They seemed to like that. But how can you not? I mean, it's a pretty good flick. Anyway, Terrors, Terrors, Aliens. It all comes together. It all comes together in this great, fabulous story called The Shaver Mysteries. Nameless asks a great question here. What is the civilization that is meant to inhabit Mount Shasta? That was the Lemurians who escaped from the destruction of their continent and built an underground city called Telos under Mount Shasta. David Morris, how you doing, David? Good to see you. Have you heard the Bigfoot recordings with Jonathan Frakes uh, from the 90s? Maybe. If it's got Jonathan Frakes involved, then I'm assuming it's from one of those shows in the 90s when they did like Fact or Faked or he did some of those other specials. I know he also did Alien Autopsy back on Fox back in the day. <sighs> yes, Telos, that's it, nameless Telos. The city of the Lemurians located underneath Mount Shasta. And that relates a little bit to this. I mean, you know, the Lemurian theosophy connection is a lot deeper than the Shaver mystery Lemurian connection. I think that I remember Lemuria is a title that Ray Palmer cooked up um, in writing these uh, stories adapted from Shaver's work. So there we go. Anywho, I don't know. I, at the end of the day, it really comes down to whether or not you think Richard Shaver was a paranoid schizophrenic or he was telling the truth about the time he spent underground at the mercy of these, you know, subterranean, you know, robotic, detrimental creatures. You know, uh, even the Tellos, even the uh, the Taros that he was allied with were wiped out by the Taros. Man, Ray of Hope says he was nuts. He was probably, he was probably nuts. When it comes down to it, he could have been. Or he could have been right on the money. And if he was, then what kind of weird world do we absolutely live in if there are Daros in caves right now under the earth? You know, what if the world is honeycombed with Darrow caves? What if they're all over the place? You know, you figure you'd catch one above ground at some point, but maybe they do. Sapphire Elf, troglodyte might be a good word for the Darrow. You're absolutely right, Sapphire Elf. Troglodyte is a great word for the Darrow. 
Troglodyte is a great word in general, and sometimes I've uh, been known to use it to describe my fellow man who doesn't seem to be so bright at times, especially in large groups. Once people get together in groups, they kind of get silly. Well, I guess that's how it goes. Human nature and all that. Okay. There was my light ready to go on me again. Caught it that time. Caught you. Richard Jensen with a good question here. What about all those strange sounds coming from underground? And, you know, there are no shortage of strange sounds coming from underground. People do report sounds that sound like boring machines or earth noises. You know, you get these growling sounds or booming sounds. Who knows where they come from? Okay. Just keeping an eye on my light here. We're running out of time, folks. We're running out of time. We're fastly running out of time. Our hour goes by quick. Our hour goes by fast. You know, that's just how it goes, though. But uh, listen, on other news, I am completely caught up on uploading these shows to the podcast feed. So, uh, and somebody left me a comment asking me, listen, would you, could, you, could you get caught up? Because I listen to these at work, and I can't do it on YouTube, but I can listen to the podcast. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'm all caught up in that regard. If you've ever missed any episodes, you can go back and check out the podcast, listen to it at your leisure, uh, you know, check it out. Check it out. Do some downloading. Get yourself some shows. Check out the back catalog. There's a lot of them there. Um, so, yeah. So, that's how it goes. Anyway, uh, we are quickly running out of time. So, I'm going to play you guys a quick video. And I'll be right back. This kind of broadcasting only works in this country. Here in America, we put on the programs that you enjoy. Then we simply come to you and ask you to support them help this system of broadcasting work we need to hear from you we also are looking for a lot of new subscribers right now so please become a new subscriber and help us reach our goal of 12,000 new subscribers but the most important thing is to get that money in and into our studios right away so that we can bring you more programs like this and you can do that on a visa mastercard or american express All right, folks. You know I like it to be nice about being when we say goodnight for the evening. I do appreciate your time, your energy, and your contributing to these conversations. Measuring from halftime, we still have 10 minutes. Ah, measuring from my clock on the wall, we've been at it for 58 minutes and 30 seconds, so we are vastly running out of time here. It's only an hour show, Spring Hill Mac. As much as I wish it was longer, uh, it's only an hour show. Listen, everybody, check out Carl Vibe. Thanks for being here, Carl Vibe. Always good to see you, man. Everybody check out his channel, get into it, dig in there. I want you all to have a great night. I want to thank you guys for being here. I hope you had fun. I hope you tell a friend, uh, share this stream, like on your way out. Let's make it happen. Cows cookie says tracksuit. You know it. You know it. So listen, check out the description of this video. Follow the links, Twitter, Instagram, email, P.O. Box, my second channel, Dark Sayings, which is audiobook recordings. Likewise, you can find ways to support the show. Spring, uh, spring store. Merchandise. PayPal, directly, or Patreon. Buck a month. Thank you so much for your consideration and for your time and for your energy. And I uh, just lost my light again. Silly me. Anyway, that's going to do it for this evening. This has been the Creepy Little Book. I've been your host, Pete. Oh, I almost forgot. Uh, oh, wait. Darius Munchausen for $1.49. Hold on. Got the popcorn popping. Thank you, Darius. Much appreciated. <clears throat> 
Zachary Gilkerson and Darius Munchausen. And I want to thank both of you guys for your generous super chats and super stickers. They are much appreciated. Never expected. We're always appreciated. Thank you to Tina Tomaszewski for moderating tonight. We do appreciate your time and your contributions to this channel, Tina. Thank you so much. Jethro Falks for $5. Slipping one in on me. Pete, thank you. No, thank you, Jethro. Thanks so much. Listen, you guys all have a great night. I'm glad you could be here. I hope you come back tomorrow. We'll do it all over again. Um, I've got a topic already selected, so I got a good idea about what we're talking about tomorrow. Should be fun. Should, uh, should be really interesting. So come back again, and we'll do it all over. Thank you for being here. This has been The Creepy Little Book. I've been your host, Pete. And until next time, stay creeped out.